Um, uh, we'll be talking about 100, uh, Sonnet 141 by William Shakespeare today. Um, sonnet 141. Let's uh, first read the, the sonnet. In faith, I do not love thee with mine eyes, for thee in thee a thousand errors note. But it's my heart that loves what they despise, who in despite on will is pleased to do it. Nor are mine ears with thy tongue's still delighted, no tender feeling to base touches strong, no taste, no smell, desire to be invited to any sensual feast with thee alone. But my five wits know my five senses can dissuade one foolish heart from serving thee, who leaves unswayed the likeness of a man, thy proud heart slave and vassal rich to be. Only my plague thus far I count my gain, that she that makes me sin avoids me pain. Let's look at uh, the discussion. The theme of Sonnet 141 is the battle between the poetic personage's wits and his heart. In the Shakespearean as well as the Renaissance context, wits were associated with reason, making it masculine, while the heart was associated with irrationally, making it feminine. As in many of the sonnets on the Dark Lady, in Sonnet 141 too, the, poetic, the poet's relationship with the Dark Lady is based on an irrational infat infatuation rather than an intellectual simulation as in his relationship with the young man. Interestingly, as explained in Sonnet 130, it, is not even the it, 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 is, it was not even physical beauty in the accepted sense of the period that drew the poetic persona to the so-called Dark Lady. Um, hence, the poetic persona constantly rebelled against the attraction he felt for a woman who, according to him, had, had enthralled him and unmanned him uh, more than, um, in more than one way. It must be noted that this outlook is very much in keeping with the classical view on male-male and male-female relationships that was in vogue during the Renaissance. According to Greco-Roman philosophy, it was only men who were capable of having relationships based on deep understanding and intellectuality. Therefore, only males could be friends of equal stature. Male-female relations, on the other hand, were mainly for physical release and to carry on the family name. However, one must take such waves with a pinch of salt as it is well documented that some of the most famous men of antiquity, such as Pericles of Athens, had both physical and intellectual relations with men, women. In Shakespeare's work, the Dark Lady Sonnets deal with a baser or more earthly form of human sexuality. Some see Shakespeare's Dark Lady Sonnets as an ironic response to Petrarchan sonnets in which an ideal female subject is glorified. According to Shakespeare specialist Catherine Duncan uh, Johns, Shakespeare in the Dark Lady Sonnets, I quote, instead of exploring the subtle and complex effects on the speaker of an obsession with a chaste and high-born lady who can never be possessed physically, offers backhanded praise of a manifestly non-aristocratic woman who is neither young, beautiful, intelligent, no chaste, but provides a perfectly adequate outlet for male desire." End quote. However, I do not agree with this view. In my view, this, uh, this confusion does not explain the, the, the emotional turmoil the poetic persona experiences at his inability to resist the lure of the woman he is attracted to. Uh, let's look at the first quatrain of the sonnet. In faith, I do not love thee with mine eyes, for they in thee a thousand errors note. But it's my heart that loves what they despise. 
who in despite of view is pleased to do it. The poet says that it is not what his eyes behold that makes him love the woman he is attracted to, for his eyes, which are under the purview of his reason, has noted thousand errors in the woman. He is perplexed by the fact that his heart insists on loving a woman in spite of the fact that his eyes despise her. His eyes rebels against the five wits and five senses in desiring or loving the woman. So his attraction is completely rational. There is a note of bewilderment when he says, I quote, but it's my heart that loves what they despise, end quote, in the third line. Though, uh, through the use of uh, cynic doshi in allocating heart and eyes independent will, the poet distances himself from the unfolding drama so that he could document the battle well. The need for distance signals confusion he is feeling due to his predicament. Moreover, in documenting his predicament by standing outside, Shakespeare illustrates the unique ability artists have to explore intensely personal experiences through their art. The word error in line two, which is an example of pun on words, refer to both his her physical force as well as moral slips born of her promiscuity. Looking at this, uh, the second quatrain, No are my ears with thine, thy tongues tuned delighted, no tender feelings to base touches from, no taste, no smell, desire to be invited to any sensual feast with thee alone. In the second quatrain, uh, continuing along the same vein, the phrase base touches in line six, it is sleazy sexual encounters. The poetic persona says that he finds no joy in the woman's voice. This could be a reference either to the harshness or the bossiness of the woman's voice or her inability to sing. The ability to sing beautifully was a much valued female accomplishment at a time when people had very few modes of entertainment. Next, he says that the woman's touch did not generate tender or loving feelings in him due to her, his certain knowledge that he was not the only one to receive them. The poetic person knew that the woman was unfaithful to him. Continuing in the same vein, the poetic person says that, his, that his other two senses, the, the sense of taste and the sense of smell too, do not find anything remarkable in the woman which would explain his obsession with her. Still, his heart desires her. The repetition of no and the use of parallelism reiterates his state of mind. Frequent use of kumas mark the man posing frequently to contemplate on the, on the issue. Looking at the third quatrain, but my five bits nor my five senses can dissuade one foolish heart from serving thee. Who gives unswayed the likeness of man, thy proud heart slave and vessel rich to be? In the third quatrain, the rational part of him, his wits and senses that are governed by his brain are over, overruled by his irrational heart, which insists on serving the woman. Once again, the term serving has more than one meaning. One may serve a woman in the sense the knight in the courtly love poem served high-born ladies, or one may also serve her sexually as in a stallion serving a mare in heat. If the second meaning were to be applied to the context, it would capture the man's state of mind better. The woman with her loose morals could very well be described as a, as a mare in heat, in such a context, males like the poetic persona in her vicinity would not be able to resist her. The poetic persona is aware of the situation, yet he loves her and desires her, and that leaves him unswayed like the likeness of a man. The term unswayed refers to the, la, the, the, the continuous attempt of his five senses and wits to sway or persuade the man's heart to give up the woman. Sway also refers 
also refers to the to the uh, to authority or power. Uh, of course, the heart cannot be persuaded, so the man is left uh, a, a mere powerless shell of a man. The poet loves a woman against his better judgment. He is aware of all her physical, moral, and intellectual flaws. Does not enjoy her voice, smell, taste, or touch, but his wits and senses cannot prevent him from loving her. As a result, the poetic persona becomes a slave and rich to the woman's whims and fancies. T.G. Tucker points out in his edition of Sonnets of Shakespeare, I quote, leaves unswayed means his heart that becomes a vessel of hers while he becomes a mere likeness of a man, in quotes. Interestingly, Shakespeare in Sonnet 57 and 58 professes to have become a slave to the fair youth without feeling his manhood unswayed. In the last couplet, only my, only my plague thus far I count my game, that she that makes me sin abodes me pain. Commenting on the, the, the often misunderstood final couplet, Stephen Booth writes, I quote, the basis of the conceit here is the idea of a soul's term of imprisonment in purgatory, end quote. The pain of the last line could be both mental and physical. The poet may, may have contracted a venereal disease from his mistress. Clearly, the lady in question does not make him happy. Therefore, the only thing he gains from the relationship is a lot of pain. And he masochistically delighted in the pain she inflicts on him out of lack of judgment and self-worth. According to Samuel Butler, the last couplet means Shakespeare believes that he shall suffer less for his sins hereafter, for he had received some of the punishment that was due to him as soon as uh, the offense was carried out here on earth. With that, uh, I would like to conclude this discussion on Sonnet 141. Thank you for being with me. Goodbye.